Joining me in the studio are a couple of our panellists, Deputy Political Editor at The Sun, Ryan Sabi, and Conservative commentator Esther Kraku, of course, but also Paul Scully, Conservative MP, is here too. He's continuously fought for the victims. Paul, very good evening to you. Thanks for uh, joining right. us. Um, this story just kind of goes from bad to worse. I mean, every time I see a politician speaking about it, and I don't include you in this, but, you know, you just think to yourself, well, is that it? Is that all you've got to say? And I know that many of you have been saying things for a long time. Yeah. Tell us your uh, version of events and, and, and what you've been saying. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm glad this is really back uh, firmly on the agenda. We had um, uh, a statement from the current Postal Affairs Minister, Kevin Holland, who's yeah. working really hard on this, just before Christmas, and it was near empty chamber. Right. Uh, yesterday, because of the drama, um, there's lots of politicians coming out and now it's nearly full. Mm. Uh, I don't blame them. It's what happens when you get the, uh, you know, a drama like that, that intensity. And it's just the same way it's engaged politicians and the same way it's engaged members of the public, members of the media and these kind of things. It's right that it's back in the public eye because we've got so much more to do mm. to put these people right as best we can mm. financially. You're never going to sort their lives out. Their lives are defined by this now. Yeah. Um, but I spent a couple of years trying to starting the inquiry after the court case that was featured in the drama, getting the compensation schemes up and running. They're still going now. Yeah. It's the best thing I'm ever going to do in politics. Yeah. But but it's still un annoying and frustrating that it's still unfinished business. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you a bit about that because we've got I think Kevin Hollyrake today uh, making another statement talking about how uh, things are progressing. Let's have a look. Overturning their convictions is also key to unlocking compensation. Each person whose horizon conviction is overturned is entitled to an interim compensation payment of £163,000. They can then choose whether to have their compensation individually assessed or to accept an upfront offer of £600,000. See, one of the questions I've got, Paul, is why are there three schemes? I know it's probably far more complicated than, than most of us could ever imagine, but it seems to me when you watch something like that, and as good as Kevin Hollyrake's statement may be, he's basically saying to people, look, you can get some money, but you've got to go through this process. Yeah. It just seems still to be incredibly complex. It is complex, but the problem is it's sort of they, un they were unrolled at different times for mm. different reasons. So the first one was what they call the historic... Well, it was originally called the historic shortfall scheme, now the horizon shortfall scheme. And basically that was people who had lost out financially, but not necessarily convicted and right. weren't in that 555. And they were people sometimes that just chucked in the towel really, really quickly, right. and still lost so much, uh, but lost financially. And that was easier to start, and then the post office advertised it, and they were able to say, you've lost out financially, this is how much you've lost, uh, plus a bit of damages, there you go. Right. Uh, still complicated, but it was, it was dealt with. You then had the people that have convicted, um, but a problem is you can't compensate in inverted commas, criminals. So they have to have their conviction right. overturned first, uh, and then they can go through that process. There's only 92 people out of the 700 plus, nearly nine, uh, between 700 and 900, we don't even know, uh, that have actually overturned their convictions. And yeah. that's what Kevin was talking about, right. that we need to fight to. So that would have be a blanket, why people like the Patel family washing. that we saw just <clears throat> yeah. there have had nothing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Varchus, uh, I've, I've, you know, I've exchanged messages over Twitter and he's been incredibly angry at times and frustrated and I totally understand why, because I've always said there's nothing I can say to him. Mm. We just got to act right. for him and his family. But the third lot are the 555 people, including Alan Bates, that took them took the post office to court yeah. in the first place because they have... And you won money in 2019. They, they won money, but most of that was swallowed up well, in legal fees because yeah. the postal post office outspent them and kept on trying to double up, double up, double up. And so because they'd had full and final settlement, government had to step in and get them to reopen the settlement. We had to go to their funders and say, right, we want you to agree not to take any more money. So there's just stupid little complexities and bureaucracy around that that we had to work our way through. Yeah. So that's how it sort of evolved over a period of time. Hence, we've ended up mm. with three streams. It's not right. ideal, but it's what we got. It is incredible, isn't it? Esther, um, <coughs> welcome to the show. And it's an incredible story, this. With every day that passes, you kind of can't quite believe that nobody's just fixing it. Yeah. I mean, the real scandal here is that the post office kept fighting it yeah, because totally. the post office admitted in 2013 that the, there, were, there were bugs with the, the, the software and that it had been fixed at the time, but there were still problems with it. And then six years down the line, that's when they finally settled for just under 60 million pounds, which I think is actually quite stingy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and they're still, they're, they, they were, for six years, they were still fighting this instead of just raising their hands up and saying, actually, 
you know, we've made a mistake, let's compensate all of these families. I think the bigger frustration, because there's a tendency to go after the big wigs, you know, the Paula Venels and the Ed Davies, is, is, is to ignore the actual structural failures of a lot of our public institutions. Why do things take so long? Why, why are our public institutions so clunky and slow and inefficient? And it's because there's no way to expedite massive failures like this. There's such, you know, a massive hierarchy chain that you can't really fast track these things. So I think it's, 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 it's a spectacular failure, but it's not surprising. Nothing really gets done when the taxpayers yeah. money is at expense because there's no one that's really accountable. And Ryan Sobey from The Sun, I mean, a spectacular failure, yes, but equally, an awful lot of the people who were involved in that spectacular failure re were rewarded for it and have still kind of involved uh, getting themselves further government contracts. Many of them um, are still making an awful lot of money from the government. Some of them from Fujitsu are still doing very well. You know, it seems as though there's an awful long line of people following on um, from the woman who's given her M uh, CBE back um, who ought to be giving something else back. Yeah, I, th I think with Fujitsu, there's a lot of government contracts mm. across the board when they're intertwined and you do wonder whether it will do more damage, more harm than good, actually, mm. by taking a lot of those contracts. Yeah. But perhaps there could be some sort of blanket ban from now on. Right. But on, you know, well, any, I heard, I mean, I think, involved. I think it was, was it The Independent this morning who had this story saying that they're now involved in flood alert contracts, uh, which might explain quite a lot about why the, the place is underwater currently, you know, but, but it just seems incredible, doesn't it? Yeah, no, exactly. And you look at Ed Davey, the, the, yeah. Sir Ed Davey, they're now calling for... There are some people saying he should have that knighthood t taken away. Yeah. If Paula Venables can have that CBE taken away, yeah. why can't Ed Davey? And it's become a good line of political attack yeah. for the Conservatives and the Tories to, to drag him into a scandal. Mm. He walks around calling for people to resign from their, yeah. from their yeah. post. And, you know, he's done that, you know, probably the best part well, of 30 So I can't find anybody who can tell me why he got a knighthood. I mean, did he just get a knighthood for being leader of the Lib Dems? Is that how it probably, works? Probably. Look, I, yeah, I'm not going to attack him politically in terms of what he did or didn't do in 2010 because I don't have the information and... I, I don't know what I'd have done given that well, situation. Well, his excuse is but, that he lied to him. But, I mean, surely... If yeah, but no, but yeah, that's not good enough. That's not good it's enough. It's not good enough. No, it's not good enough. The whole, the whole point, point whole... is you speak to Alan Bates, yeah. you speak to the other people right. and actually then weigh out what you've, what you've got. If you're only taking one, one view, yeah. then, of course, you can say what you want ten years later. But I think Ryan had uh, hit it on the head when he said the fact that Ed has actually always the first person yeah. to want to recall Parliament, to mm. have a go at everything, and don't themselves. look at the... De they never do detail. Mm. Uh, it's always just, yeah, resign, 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 and then look at this. And I, I think, you know, the whole kind of this, this fixation on, oh, this person must resign, this person must resign, you ignore the bigger issue. Right? This, this didn't just fall on the shoulders of one person. Right. This was something that happened in well over a decade. Yeah. It's an institutional failure. How do, you, how do you change the institution so that this doesn't happen right. again? Well, I was watching just this afternoon um, um, a, a video a package of Tony Blair introducing yeah. um, the whole system. You know, with Gordon Brown to his right and Alistair Darling to his left and, you know, the Labour front bench looking very sort of technocratic and saying we've got this brand new system coming in, it's going to be great, it's going to be terrific. You know, it goes all the way back to, to, to that Labour government. And so, you know, it's not about party political allegiance really, is it? There's, there's it's about a kind of seismic it. failure of anybody to ask a question. There's three parties that have, that have overseen this, and include the Conservatives, obviously, in, in that in the last few in, in, the, in the last few years. Um, so it's not a party political thing, but it is systemic, is exactly as you say. And crikey, those of us that remember back 20 years that we're using it, computers for anything, yeah. remember how buggy software can be. So why would this be any right. any different? It's bought, about asking questions. If you bought questions. a faulty car, if if, 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 if manufacturers <laughs> release faulty cars that people bought, and then they suffered an accident or something like that, that's a class action mm. lawsuit immediately, mm. right? Where is the, that that version for? for for Fujitsu and this this dodgy software, at least on the, on the government side. Well, I think what's what we're doing now, the statutory inquiry that I started um, uh, a few years back, is still going on. Why? Because there's a load of documents that mm. keep getting disclosed, yeah. uh, to, you know, by the post office and others to to the uh, the chairman. Uh, and that's there's thousands of pages that's right. got to go through. So it's delaying it by months and months and months. So, but that will start to get the answers that we're all looking for, yeah. and then you can get the accountability. That's when you get the justice. I think it so was get a the bit compensation. Now, when, um, justice in yeah. it, it later. But presumably, it there will be people making calls to these compensation, um, you know, kind of offers who will be told, well, if you accept 600,000, that'll be it. You won't be able to come after us any longer because there'll have to be legal sort of positions well, limit, limits set out, there right? As well. And that again is is kind of a disservice. You need to, you need to I'm, throw I'm life changing. Blaming you for no, you need to throw life changing money at these people. These people, oh, their, their lives are now defined by this. Yes. Yeah. You know, there are lots of people with PTSD, with mental health problems, with eating disorders. Their family's broken down. Uh, they've lost family. Some people have been chased out of the country. Right. Uh, so you cannot. Do, we cannot do enough. No, of course. Sure but but what Kevin Hollingbrook's saying, though, he's saying that you will either accept the statutory 600,000 
or you might take another decision. Again, that's putting an awful lot of pressure on people to say, all right, do you want to try and get, you know, see how you do, welcome, come on down, you I, might or, get or, a million or and a half, or you might not. I think it's good intentions because he's trying to get money out quickly, but, uh, but I, uh, you know, as I say, I think you do need to throw life I mean, after, money out. Yeah, after 20 years of getting nothing and getting, grand and getting stonewalled by, by everyone you spoke to, mm. suddenly you're being told, here's 600,000, or maybe you'd like to take your chance and, get, and win a million. It's not really the way to do it, is no, it? No, I shouldn't be gambling like that. I mean, that. I think one of the frustrations, because we all know that a lot of our public services are run in a very clunky and inefficient way, but one of the frustrations is, why does there have to be national outrage before something is done? That, that's, that is, mm. I mean, it's unfortunate that when the, the case was uh, sort of wrapped up, it was just before COVID happened, so the national tension was elsewhere. But whenever something like this happens, you really have to have the whole country just being infuriated by it for anything to happen. Yeah. I think, to be fair, no, stuff is happening. What this is doing, though, uh, as I say, it's well, it's also giving Kevin, I think, a little bit of levers within government and elsewhere to say, you know, I've been working on this for a couple of years, as I was a couple of years before that. Mm -hmm. But to Treasury, number 10, whoever he needs to say, say, look, the country is watching. Yeah. We've got to do this. So I think it's giving him a lot of power. More oxygen. So, the, so I'm, I'm glad we're talking about it still now, and I hope we're talking about it for days to come. Because you know what? When we're talking about things like Israel and Gaza, we're not talking about Ukraine. We're not talking about yeah. Yemen before that. We're not talking about Burma before that. People can only tend to deal with one big crisis mm -hmm. at a time, yeah. with big pictures, emotive videos, dramas like this. Yeah. It's really important that we keep this on the front foot until we get it sorted. Yeah, absolutely right. Adam Crowes is an interesting one as well because he doesn't get a mention in the ITV drama. Strangely enough, um, he used to run ITV. wonder how that happened. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's true. Like, I mean, I think to be fair, and I don't really know that. I, th I, I suspect it's more the fact that Adam Crozier was not uh, as integral a part of the drama series mm -hmm. as uh, you know, in, in terms of where he was at the time, where right. Horizon was at the time, than than the conspiracy. But mm. I can understand why people are asking that question. Yeah, and I mean, as far as the people who made the series are concerned, and, and the, the, the people who who are now saying it's one of the great sort of uh, commissioned pieces of drama that's ever been done in Britain. Um, have you had any dealings with them? Have they, did they come to anybody in Parliament to ask them anything about, you know, what to base the storylines on or, you know, well, have, in they, Parliament, have they represented yeah. anything? In Parliament, yeah, my partner, I was watching it with my partner and she said, um, God, that person that's playing Nazim Zahawi, it's an incredible likeness of him. Yes. It was, it was him. <laughs> and there he was. Uh, he spent half a day, I think, learning his lines that he'd said um, uh, uh, yeah. know, a few years before. I'm sure he had a lot of fun that, that... But actually, he, he, did, he did much better in the post office scandal um, at playing himself because he actually looked far more believable than he ever did <laughs> uh, when he was in the government. But no, it did. Yeah. Um, they, they covered... Um, so they had him in... They had uh, Nick Wallace, the journalist that's been yeah. covering this diligently for, for many, many years now. It's almost his life's work. He was the chief consultant on it. So right. they had a lot of... She was... Um, so uh, Gwyn Hughes that wrote it spent three years mm. uh, researching this, yeah. speaking to all the postmasters. It was quite intense. It's incredible. That's how you get to the public, right? You create a drama totally. around it for someone to watch it. Totally. <laughs> I mean, she's, she's created this sense of urgency, hasn't she, in government? Yeah. They are now. You just you just feel it amongst you know all the different departments. They are trying to create this blanket yeah. overhaul of those convictions. Yes. And you feel like there's news just mm. days away before they're actually. Come and I do. I mean, I do actually have some sympathy with those who say that the reason it took this long is because it is a complicated story. And it is. Yeah. I mean, I've listened to, to, to Jake talking about. Um, you know, some of the, the difficulties of getting it into the sort of mainstream yeah. of the BBC. You know, I mean, we had the guy from Computer Weekly here last night and he said he's been waiting since 2009 yeah. for the BBC to lead with it and finally they led with it last night, you know, since 2009 because it's not a particularly sexy story, it's not a particularly easy story to understand or to tell. There's very lots, there's lots of layers and complications and all of that and it's not a soundbite story. No, most people, you know, most uh, commissioners and editors, if you say that you try to bid in for something from Computer Weekly, mm. that's <laughs> like yeah. that, but, you know, but they've done amazing work. Computer Weekly have done really diligent, careful work right. on a really technical mm. uh, issue here, which most of us, even now, when you're watch watching Monica Doleman, who played Joe, Joe Hamilton, sitting there agog at the figures going up, it's almost unbelievable. You needed that sort of um, thing at the beginning that said, this is a true story. You yeah. almost needed yeah. that every advert break to because uh, it was so full on the other bit i think we need to not forget is not just that there was you know um negligence and there was people who overlooked things and they weren't convincing enough at the time or they didn't look hard enough there was also quite malicious intent from some of the people working from the post office side who were terribly um badly treating some of the people that had worked for them for many, many years and who convinced them all that literally nothing else was happening anywhere else. It was only them that was having a problem. Mm. You know, they lied to them 
and they and they treated them terribly, and that I think can't be forgotten. With contempt, totally. yeah. I, I mean, I think one of the things that have been ha have been highlighted with this is the fact that there was almost confirmation bias because mm. before this software was, it was rolled that, out, exactly. people believed that you know they were they were effectively nicking money from the, the post office, and so when this glitch happened with the software, it was like, aha, we found you, we've we've we figured you out. So there was a, a, almost a reluctance to actually investigate a potential glitch with the software because it confirmed all their biases. So of course they were going to treat these people with contempt because they already thought that they were stealing from yeah. the post office anyway. They but believe that. That's the thing that I find astonishing. Because journalists like Ryan, you were you know, saying this, there were people that are looking at this and then suddenly they get arrested, they get convicted. You're going to sit there and think, mm. if you don't really understand the detail behind it, you're going to think, oh, well, there's no smoke without fire. That's probably yeah. what's gonna, going on. So it's, it's, But you're right, Esther, when you were talking about... Um, you know, public services, big organisations and these kind of things. There was definitely groupthink. There was yeah, definitely absolutely. just defaulting to brand reputational ma management rather than mm. forgetting these are human and beings. And hierarchical yeah. human structures process. just yeah. completely It's really bad. This is really, we've asked you know, we've people... got to be human beings first, politicians second. It's all about human cost here. Well, it is. And we've asked people who they think is ultimately responsible. Angela says the post office and parcel force should be put out of business and the job given to a company like DHL or somebody else with no involvement from the government. Benel should also hand back the millions she made as severance pay. A lot of people saying that as well. She did quite well out of this particular also, job. She did very well afterwards. Got lots of, you know, and directorships. Got some other directorships. She well. got an NHS trust, I think, at one point. She was nearly made a bishop yeah. by old um, uh, Archbishop Justin, Wokeby. Yeah. You know, he wanted to make her a bishop, for heaven's sake. But surely so, some, someone... <laughs> the horror. Yeah, I know. <laughs> surely someone at the post office or Fujitsu should have said, well, actually, there may be some cases every year which are investigated, but it's just spiked. Yeah. You know, two, three hundred cases, you know, every year. That can't be no. right. Mm. Unbelievable stuff. Absolutely incredible. Thank you, guys. We'll come back to you uh, coming up a little bit later on the show. Right now, though, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. And